And so I think what our group and others are starting to do now, especially with um, kind of the new uh, studies being planned, is um, get at this um, uh, kind of personalized and precision medicine approach to understanding clusters of concussed patients and what makes them similar to one another whether it be the mechanism of their injury, the sport in which they incurred the injury, or the act in which they incurred the injury, like a motor vehicle accident or through military exposures, uh, or whether it's the um, pre-existing conditions in which they come into the concussion or the after effects of the concussion. Right. What makes them cluster together and unique that might allow us to understand their mechanism. Oh, this group is suffering from autonomic dysfunction. It makes them all similar. Let's treat them with, you know, right. known therapies for autonomic dysfunction. This group is a kind of more migraine heavy group. Right. Um, and that's the kind of um, the flavor of their post-concussive symptoms. Let's treat them with migraine therapy. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a cool, uh, that's a cool new thing that a, a cool new direction that I see post-concussion going is this, what we call phenotypes, right? Which means um, kind of a, like a typical clinical presentation for this person. These these people tend to be sort of this migraine kind of post-concussion patient. Right. These people tend to be the autonomic dysregulation kind of patient. Um, and I think that's a direction that, you know, post-concussion diagnosis and care is headed in. Yeah. And then that dictates treatment, right? Like you mentioned. Good. So yeah. that leads me to the next thing, which is how do we treat autonomic dysfunction, man? How do we do it? Well, let me just say one more thing, because um, when you think about these different endophenotypes where you have the you know biological markers and symptoms that kind of um, really characterize a group, um, it's unlikely that those are going to be so purely in one cluster right. or endophenotype the and the migraineurs are going to be so clearly migraineurs, but right. not you know, autonomic dysfunction. And so there's going to be overlap. overlap. Yeah. And so we're always going to be doing, and, and naturally um, at our brain support group, but, but other um, concussive uh, clinics, we'll take a multidisciplinary, multifactorial right, right. approach and try to hit many of these common symptom clusters. The other thing to mention here that brings up uh, kind of the topic of the conversation today is that um, these these symptoms that make up post-concussive symptoms don't map back to a brain region or even a brain circuit. They map back to, in some cases, you know, the autonomic nervous system, which has peripheral, you know, uh, reaches. And in some cases, uh, regions that were not even close to the area that was hit by the insulting injury. Right. Um, and sometimes to brain regions like the cerebellum, which is involved in kind of dizziness or um, other areas that are involved in, in cognition uh, that are, you know, only loosely connected or wouldn't necessarily be thought of in the same, you know, brain network. So the fact that these symptoms don't map closely back to one brain system, one brain network means that there's multiple factors causing post-concussive symptoms. And if you could at least cluster some of these factors or symptoms, then you might find a common mechanism that you can then treat. Right. So that's yeah. the idea behind yeah. it all. Yeah. Anyway. So how do we treat it? Autonomic treatment? Yeah, yeah. Autonomic treatment. Let's get to it. That's really what I've been like teeing up the last like 30 minutes for. It's like, <laughs> how do we treat this? So for uh, autonomic dysfunction in the kind of realm of POTS, if let's say we diagnose someone with POTS, maybe we got some more sophisticated testing like uh, autonomic reflex testing where they do the tilt table right, right. that you talked about. They do sweat testing and some other uh, kind of uh, exertional activities to kind of test the reaches and, and impact uh, on the autonomic nervous system. Uh, well, let's say they were diagnosed with POTS, we would start with conservative management, which just means lifestyle uh, and behavioral um, uh, changes. And so that could be um, something like increasing water intake, increasing salt intake, when up and around and or physically um, active wearing compression socks, um, and then kind of uh, elevating the head of the bed a little bit um, uh, when sleeping, and then getting up kind of slowly all of those things, and and frankly, increasing exercise despite having some symptoms as long as that's safe, as long as you know uh, or the patient knows they're not going to pass out. And so that's a delicate area, but the patient will constantly be learning their limits right. and you kind of help them along. So those are the behavioral and lifestyle management techniques to uh, get someone 
who has criteria for POTS to have better autonomic tone, right. control over their right. blood vessel um, contractions and their kind of heart rate modification. So basically just the, it sounds like just um, um, limiting the clinical manifestations of your autonomic dysfunction. Yeah, right? you actually also kind of improving the, the function tone. of the autonomic system. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the and that's it. Is that, that, is well, that that's it? the behavioral and lifestyle management. And okay. If they fail, if patients fail that or only receive some benefit, but are still having, um, you know, severe fatigue or um, cognitive fogging or uh, you know exercise intolerance or syncope, passing out um, while on on their feet, um, then you move to medications that affect the heart rate, uh, heart rhythm directly, could affect blood pressure and things like that. Yeah. And so uh, there's whole classes of medications that I'm not expert in, but we have um, kind of autonomic specialists to kind of work through iteratively these different classes to find the right um, set of meds and behavioral lifestyle changes to get that person's symptoms kind of uh, tolerable right. so that they could increase their activities. Right. So what, what the point that I want to get to is okay. So you're talking about these cool objective measures: heart rate variability um, after concussion, denoting autonomic dysregulation, cerebrovascular reactivity. Cool stuff, right? Is there a potential treatment, maybe not instituted as standard of care, but on the horizon that you can foresee? All right, we do this, and then we see improvement in the objective measures of autonomic dysregulation, like HRV, CVR, you know, anything like that. Yeah. So uh, you know, there's a lot of um, you call it closed loop systems where um, essentially the system will use biofeedback like, you know, low heart rate variability um, to trigger um, some type of uh, brain stimulation or uh, peripheral nerve stimulation protocol that will enhance the function of the abnormality. And so if, if we're talking about heart rate variability, um, you might think of uh, vagal nerve stimulation is, right. is a hot topic right now. It's a non-invasive uh, stimulation technique that can uh, be done safely outside the body. Uh, there are there are implantable vagal nerve stimulators that are approved for other conditions like epilepsy. But in this case, um, th experimentally, there are studies looking at vagal nerve stimulation from just external to the ear, right behind the ear, mm -hmm. where uh, the vagus nerve kind of courses out of the skull and then makes its path as a vagabond throughout the, the body to hit a lot of the organ systems to carry the parasympathetic signals down to the body. If you introduce uh, some stimulation at key periods or periodically, um, yeah, you can improve the the vagal nerve uh, tone and control over heart rate variability and other auto autonomic functions. Yeah. What about um, any psychotherapy, like um, a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy or anything like that, that you've noticed improves autonomic dysregulation? Well, I can just say that, um, it, you know, really depends on what we're talking about when we say autonomic dysregulation, but there are um, a plethora of cognitive behavioral and other uh, psychotherapeutic uh, interventions that don't have anything to do with stimulation or medication right. that can be used to uh, give someone a little bit more control over their autonomic responses. And so a classic condition to think about this in is a post-traumatic stress disorder in which mm -hmm. the autonomic nervous system is hyperactive, right. uh, especially to stimuli that resemble or in any way remind the individual of the traumatic event. Right. And um, and so uh, one of those therapies is called exposure therapy, in which um, the individual will be introduced to uh, things that resemble or are uh, similar or are um, actually uh, components of the context or the stimuli in which they incurred the trauma, right. and uh, gradually building on the richness and the realness of that um, that stimulation uh, until. Um, the individual is able to kind of modify and um, and gain control over their autonomic response to that. And so that's not classic autonomic dysfunction per se, but that has something to do with what I was talking about before with the central control over the autonomic right. nervous system. If centrally inside the brain, the um, regions that um, charge up and, and kind of really control autonomic outflow are affected by trauma, physical, emotional, um, then the autonomic response to the world can be abnormal and could cause a hypervigilance or um, at least be related to, in time, um, the 
kind of behavioral manifestations of things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. And I think that, you know, and the reason I bring that up is I think that's one thing in common with post-concussive symptoms. Those patients who have persistent symptoms tend to have um, uh, an exaggerated nervous system response to stimuli um, that provoke symptoms. Right. Uh, and that's something that's being hotly um, kind of um, uh, investigated right now in um, in the form of one kind of symptom inventories to get at uh, whether there is a phenotype um, th- of patients with post-concussive symptoms that are overly sensitized to stimuli and avoid those stimuli and over time build patterns to avoid stimuli and oversensitize themselves right. and to never be able to kind of really reintroduce normal activities. And that in and of itself is kind of a reinforcer and kind of force multiplier bringing on new symptoms. I mean, if you don't go out in the light for X amount of days, going right. out in the light's not only going to cause light sensitivity, but it might even cause headaches. It might cause kind of cognitive fogging and it might be the mechanism uh, by which a lot of these disparate symptoms that don't tie back to one brain region are related to post-concussive because in the aftermath, patients can tend to avoid things that cause symptoms. Right. And so the only way to kind of get around that, or at least one of the ways that's being studied is exposure therapy, just as you would with- With PTSD. PTSD, right. reintroducing um, the stimuli that um, the individual is avoiding. Let's say exercise causes headaches. And so, uh, you know, little by little exercise is avoided more and more. And then the the individual becomes exercise intolerant every time they even kind of step on a treadmill, maybe even cause an emotional reaction because right. they just don't want to feel terrible after exercising. Right. They don't want to get the migraine. They don't want to get the lightheadedness. They don't want to feel the hours of brain fog afterwards. And so because of that, um, they lose their tone, their um, fitness and endurance, and they become hyper um, kind of sensitized to the act, the even thought of, of get, right. getting so, so, so what you're saying is uh, certainly there's like a, like a volitional I don't, I don't want to get symptoms, so I'm not going to do this. It's called like the fear avoidance behavior pattern that we see after concussion, right? Mm -hmm. I do this, I have symptoms, I don't want to do that anymore, right? Um, But you're also saying that there might be potentially like an autonomic component to that when, especially when you get into a pattern where you're constantly avoiding, constantly avoiding your symptoms, you um, build up that neural circuitry in your brain, right? So that potentially... When you go to do that exercise, let's say you've been you've been doing that fear avoidance pattern for like six months to a year, and then you try to go back to it. Not only is it you have symptoms, but there might be this sort of sympathetic dump or autonomic dysregulation when you do the exercise because of that strong neural circuitry that you've developed over the last six months to a year, right? That would actually contribute you uh, to you. Uh, becoming anxious, being you know fearful of the of the symptoms, and maybe accentuating a lot of these symptoms and making it more difficult for you to actually do the exercise. Agreed completely. You know, I think, and I would just add that I wouldn't say it's necessarily volitional that avoidance occurs. I mean, you know, if light was was uh, causing you know pain in your eyes or head, uh, you might not have to think too much about avoiding light. It might just happen, or you might have gotten the advice from a physician or a family member. Right, right. Hey, let's take it easy. Let's get off the cell phone. No screen time. You know, no movies. No this. No that. No friends. No overstimulation. Let's let your brain rest. And they do. You know, the individual takes that advice because it's from a trusted person and does that for a week and two weeks, and then they go out into the light, and everything causes symptoms. Right. And it's not just the symptoms they started with; it's everything. And so, of course, you know, again, if you can just imagine, and I think this is the best example, you know, going in a dark room, pitch black, no light, light deprivation, and then going out into the light, that's going to be blinding. It's going to feel terrible. And um, and that is the nervous system's natural response. It habituates to a new environment right. and then becomes sensitive to the opposite or, you know, something representing a, uh, a um, kind of stimulus to that system. That is your favorite analogy that you give patients. Yeah. I can say that for sure because um, I see patients it. with you and I've seen it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, here comes the uh, in the dark room analogy. This light deprivation. This light, light deprivation analogy. <laughs> all right. Listen, great talk on autonomic dysregulation, but I think we got to shift now to something equally, if not more interesting that you're doing. Um, functional 
MRI imaging. Give it to me. 